Thank you for being here on a Friday night. I'm excited to be in the United Kingdom. It is not my first trip here, although it is my first trip outside of London. And I know that as an, uh, as a, an American, oftentimes people see New York or Los Angeles or one of our major cities, and they don't really appreciate sort of the other uh, diversity of our country. And so it's a pleasure to be outside of London and uh, here in Oxford uh, to, to, to address you. Um, you know, I'm excited that we're going to have a chance to talk about what's on your mind and take questions. I just wanted to, to take a few minutes to talk about what's on my mind, to take the opportunity of personal privilege to do that. You know, I was, there's really no greater um, relationship worldwide than the relationship between my home country, the United States, and the United Kingdom. Uh, we not only share a common language, a common law, and a common history, um, we are just great friends and share a really a common bond of tradition and values that, that, that I saw, especially when I was acting Attorney General, worked very closely uh, with your Home Secretary and your Attorney General on important law enforcement issues like combating international terrorism and working on law enforcement issues like uh, international drug cartels. And so uh, when I was Chief of Staff with General Sessions, we came here and we visited um, uh, both the Home Secretary and the Attorney General. And, uh, it was a, a very important uh, cementing and, and continuation of those relationships um, that we share um, uh, world in the world. And the important relationship we, we share together as world leaders. Um, really, you know, our, our relationship since, um, since our little, you know, sort of frustrating division we had, you know, 300 years ago, has, uh, we've, we've mended those bonds and now we, we get along really well and I'm excited. Um, to be here. As, as some of you know, I'm a, I'm a proud Iowan. What's that mean? Uh, I'm from Des Moines, Iowa, which, you know, maybe you learned a little bit about over the last month because the Iowa caucuses every four years bring that state and that, that area uh, to the attention of not only the United States but in the world. Um, you know, I had the great fortune of being bigger and faster than my peers, and so in, in the United States, they make you an American football player. And so, um, I played that in high school, got a full ride scholarship to go to the University of Iowa, where uh, in high school I was bigger and faster than my peers. When I got to the University of Iowa, they were the same size as me and, and they hit twice as hard. And so I quickly realized that probably education, instead of r running full speed headlong into full size men, unlike rugby, we wear helmets and shoulder pads, which is much safer than um, in the sport of rugby where they don't, you know, they just run headlong into each other anyway with, with no protection. But um, you know, I was able to get my undergrad uh, and then my law degree and my MBA. Most of it paid for by my football scholarship. And, uh, you know, I was, I was proud of that, um, that I was able to accomplish all of that uh, as a young man. But then I set out in the world um, to find my way. But one of the interesting, uh, you know, sort of if you find a, an American football player and they always have their old, you know, for football stories. And I know in, in the UK saying football, it's, it's, it's dystopian a little bit because it's, you know, the difference between soccer and football. We, you know, we've, we've hijacked the name football, and we call it a different sport. Um, but anyway, we, we, one of the great opportunities I had uh, at the University of Iowa was to play in the Rose Bowl, which is the, called the granddaddy of them all. It's the postseason um, bowl game. And one of the things that Sarah made sure that I wasn't going to talk about is spend an hour talking about the benefits of the, the bowl system versus the playoff system in American football because I could go all day about that, but instead I'm, I'm gonna talk about the uh, one small football story, and that is right before the Rose Bowl was to start and, and to kick off, um, Coach Hayden Fry, who was my head football coach and is a, a Hall of Fame football coach, invited a, another Hall of Famer, a horse racing trainer named D. Wayne Lucas, who has won two Kentucky Derbies um, as a horse trainer to speak to the team. And he took that opportunity to give his four point plan for success in life. And it's a speech that I would have paid a lot of money probably in any other setting. But by the time he was to point three that you have to have a plan, um, D. Wayne uh, realized that both the referees and, the, and CBS television wanted us to take the field. And so, in, 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 and by the fourth point of his speech, which I don't remember, uh, he was interrupted by the referee's whistle to get us on the field because we were, the game was going to start late. And I learned some important lessons from that speech uh, before the Rose Bowl. One is to understand your audience, and to two, understand the amount of time you have to speak. So that's why I think I'm going to take an hour and a half and talk about 
25-point plan to reform the American system of justice. Uh, obviously, that's a joke. I'm not going to do that, but it is, uh, it is something that I learned very well. To serve as acting attorney general was an honor of a lifetime. You know, I was the only person that shook um, Jeff Sessions' hand on his last day on the job and shook Bill Barr's hand on his first day on the job. And, and uh, to, to, to bridge that gap in a very difficult time in American history uh, with the Mueller investigation going on and all the other challenges we faced um, at the Department of Justice, it was obviously a, um, a challenging time, but it was an honor of a lifetime to serve. You know, I, and it was my second uh, go around at the Department of Justice. I had been the United States Attorney, so a, um, one of the 94 U.S. attorneys in the country, and I had, rep uh, had been the prosecutor and managed an office of 22 assistant United States attorneys in the uh, southern half of Iowa, my home state, headquartered in Des Moines. Um, my second stint, I came to Washington, D.C. I was kind of conscripted. I was uh, not asked to serve as chief of staff. I was kind of told that I was going to serve as chief of staff to Jeff Sessions at the Department of Justice. And, uh, and I did it with great enthusiasm because I really believe in the mission of the Department of Justice and what it stands for and wearing the white hat and um, helping victims um, recover from crimes to protect our country from terrorist acts and all the, all the portfolio of work that we do at the Department of Justice. And then um, on November 8th, I was made the Acting Attorney General of the United States. I commuted to work that day um, and left uh, in, in, in a private vehicle and parked in the garage in the basement. I left uh, with an FBI security detail in an armored SUV. It was one of the strangest uh, uh, moments in my life. And uh, that whole night, um, while the SUV idled outside of my apartment, I kept wondering what had happened. And uh, at one moment when they, I didn't know it at the time, but they needed to refill the SUV from idling outside. At about three in the morning, the SUV drove away. And I thought, did it end already? That was quick. <laughs> but nonetheless, I found out they were just rotating and, uh, and filling up the SUV with gas that had been idling all night. Um, you know, we, we had major accomplishments um, in my time at the Department of Justice. We, we were given an exe uh, executive order by the president to reduce crime in America. And, you know, we had our, our violent crime, our murder rate in our, in our nation's 30 largest cities had increased in, in 15 and 16, and we were uh, charged with reducing crime in America and not presiding over a continuing increase in that. <coughs> We've combated the opioid epidemic. I know that the United Kingdom has faced its own unique challenges with opioids like heroin and fentanyl and the like. And, you know, we had 70,000 people die in 2018 uh, of, of uh, opioid overdoses and drug overdoses. And so that was too much. And so we, we worked a lot and surged a lot of resources into our U.S. Attorney's Office at DOJ to combat that. And then, you know, we had in the United States a, a challenge uh, really with the, mora uh, the morale and the support for law enforcement. And one of the things that this president uh, made sure is that we would back the men and women in our police departments. We wouldn't blame all police uh, for incidents that involving either poor training or poor decision making by one cop. And so, you know, that was one of the major initiatives we did was to back the men and women in blue. Um, you know, and the D DOJ is not without failure. You know, we could, uh, I'm sure we're going to come up with plenty of questions on the Mueller investigation, something that I'm very well versed on. You know, it, fundamentally, uh, the Mueller investigation was charged with looking as to whether or not the Trump campaign and Donald Trump colluded with the Russian government um, in the 2016 elections, and they came up with no evidence of that happening. Wrote a 440 plus page report to that, and then also um, part two covered this whole idea that somehow the president had obstructed justice through various means, like um, asking his attorney, his uh, White House counsel to do something who didn't end up doing it by sending a tweet directed at Jeff Sessions and several other acts. None of those were deemed uh, to be criminal offenses. And it's kind of that kind of fizzled out. And then we went into the Ukraine phone call about a day later, and that turned into impeachment. Um, and then that ended with a big fizzle. And so I'm bracing myself for what's next in the great American experiment that we, uh, and what, you know, what is gonna be created to try to weaken this president and, and uh, uh, politically. And uh, I don't think, you know, I was, I was mentioning earlier to some folks I just, this, my experience with President Trump is he is tireless, he is 
uh, he does not uh, grow weary, and what you see is what you get. And he's gonna he's going to um, battle and fight uh, every day, and he's gonna have he knows he's gonna have people that oppose him, and he's gonna continue to um, do what he was elected by over 60 million Americans to do. And I'm sure again that will be some of your questions will be based on that. Um, you know, just a couple quick comments about the impeachment and, uh, and, and my thoughts on it. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure, I, I know that in my experience in traveling the gl globe, I've seen a lot of CNN um, International, a lot of CNN programming, and I had actually, before I went to the Department of Justice, the last time I was a CNN contributor. So I'm familiar with that powerful international platform. I spend a lot of time um, commenting and talking about these issues on Fox News, which I haven't found a single Fox News channel. Uh, I know there's Sky News and, and others that are owned by Murdoch and, that, and those companies, but um, you know I haven't seen. But that's where I spend a lot of time talking about the news of the day and talking about these legal issues. And so, to some extent, um, you know, I, I I feel a little bit like I'm repeating myself, but I want to make sure that everybody in this room knows where I'm coming from on this impeachment um, situation. And that is, it is a it was a purely political process, uh, meaning that the House of Representatives uh, voted on completely party line, so Democrats only voted for the two articles of impeachment. One was the obstruction of Congress, and the other was the abuse of power. And those charges were then sent, and we, we it, you know, anybody that watched any of the proceedings, all you had to do was watch about five minutes of either side, because they just kept repeating themselves over and over, because it was just not much to the case, ultimately. But you know, one of the things that I wanted to, everyone to make sure is that on this, abu on this abuse of power idea, ultimately that is in the eye of the beholder. You know, sort of as a trained lawyer, I'm used to, you have elements uh, to a crime and then you have the facts and you, you argue about how the facts meet those elements of a crime. In this case, abuse of power didn't have any elements and so it could ultimately be whatever you wanted it to be. And, and it's in the eye of the beholder. And then, you know, the, the second charge, in which convinced not a single Republican to vote for it in the Senate, even Mitt Romney, uh, was this, this obstruction of Congress, which is an idea that Congress, if they send a subpoena to you, is, even as a key advisor to the president, that, that you don't have, you're not allowed to follow the typical process of going to the courts and having a court decide of whether or not you um, have to respond to Congress's subpoena and, and, and have that fight out in, in Article Three courts. And so I think that was a, that was just something, it was, it, was, it was rushed, it was purposely rushed, it was, on a, it was on a calendar, they wanted to get it done before Christmas, and they just short-circuited a lot of kind of the, the things that they would have needed to ultimately put a case if they could together, which ultimately, you know, and again, that's gone. Uh, we can talk about whether or not it's going to happen again. I certainly believe when Donald Trump wins re-election that, that if the Democrats control the House, we'll expect this to be played out again, and it's, it's sad. It was very disruptive, and, and it did not help America, but at the same time, um, in, our, in our, what used to be a 24-hour news cycle, it now seems like it's about an eight-hour news cycle. And I feel like being here, I'm now ahead of the news cycle, like, you know, since it's, it's happening right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing on Twitter and, and, on, and, and in like the Politico playbook and all the things that, that you pay attention to uh, when you're following these, that you know, it, it, everything just continues to evolve. I was happy to see that Mick was here um, Wednesday and made news. He you know, called, you know, I'm a Republican, he's a Republican, and he said that they were, I think it was reported he said, I don't know if he said this, some of you were probably in that room, um, that Republicans are irresponsible run, by running up debt and deficits in the United States. And again, that's something um, that, that I think is very interesting. Ultimately, Congress on both sides, especially now that we have Democrats controlling the House and Republicans controlling the Senate, um, you know, Congress is the one that makes these spending bills, and unless we want shutdowns, which I was the Attorney General while, during a shutdown, a 30-plus day shutdown, which was brutal, as you can imagine, um, when you have to work with law enforcement that you're asking to sacrifice maybe ultimately their lives for their country that's not paying them. I mean, those, those kind of shutdowns are very dangerous and, and are not, not helpful, and so unless you want to risk a shutdown, you know, the President has very little power on these spending bills and how much money is spent by, by the House and Senate when they send him the bills. Um, you know, I just, before I, I sit down with Sarah and we, and we have a, a chat and answer some questions, I do, um, you know, I've, 
I've run for public office twice. I've served uh, in appointed positions, once in the Senate confirmed U.S. Attorney and then, and then both as a Chief of Staff and, and Acting Attorney General. And, you know, I, I came really feel like I described in, my, in the opening, you know, sort of I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. There's actually a small town outside of Des Moines, Iowa. Iowa's known for being the largest producer of corn, soybeans, and pigs. And so it's, you know, it's not somewhere where typically, um, you know, coastal elites, Harvard, Yale, you know, Cal Berkeley, those types of places often produce, uh, you know, the, the arguably the really smart people that serve in our government. But, you know, my point has always been is that I have a heart for public service. There's plenty of talent all over, not only the country, but all over the globe and in your country as well. And, and I'm, I, I think I still look forward to the next opportunity to serve. I don't know if it's gonna be in this administration. I don't know if it'll be uh, as a dog catcher of my hometown of Ankeny, but anyway, either, however it manifests, uh, I know that it's a noble calling. I know that it's the most rewarding work I've ever done. And all I would ask is join me. Raise your hand, participate in however you find a way to participate in politics, in civic, uh, in your community, however you do. Just don't um, see sort of the idea that, you know, life's about making more money and stacking gold coins on top of each other. That's not what it's about. It's about human beings and how we manage our communities and our lives and making this place better for future generations. So with that, um, conclude my remarks. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you and I look forward to taking your questions. I wanted to start by asking um, if you could tell us a bit about the lead up to Jeff Sessions' resignation and what the transition was like for you from working as his chief of staff to acting attorney general and whether you expected this at all at any point. Well, I had been chief of staff um, at the time Jeff Sessions resigned for um, 13 months. And so I'd seen a full year of kind of what the rhythm of the Department of Justice and the Attorney General's office was. I was familiar with all of the Assistant Attorney Generals, all of the U.S. Attorneys, kind of all the um, inside DOJ, how it was organized, and then also, you know, had known all of the folks at the White House, all of the other Cabinet Secretaries, their Chiefs of Staff. So I had a lot of relationships across the entire government. And I, uh, so I, was, I, I feel like I was prepared. And, and, and the thing that really prepared me the most, in addition to sort of that calendar of, of spending 13 months um, as chief and kind of being in the room when the decisions were being made and the meetings were happening and knowing kind of what was going on, um, except for one large thing, and that was since Sessions was recused from the Mueller investigation, the whole office was, and so I had no visibility into that piece. But that being said, um, what really prepared me was having been a U.S. attorney uh, for five and a half years. I had interacted and seen the Department of Justice from sort of the other direction instead of the top-down view. I had seen it from the bottom up, from the field, if you will. I, I don't like that term because I think it's a little bit derogatory to the folks that are actually doing the work at the Department of Justice who are deployed across our country in our U.S. Attorney's offices and our FBI field offices and ATF field offices and U.S. Marshal's offices and, and uh, DEA is another law enforcement agency under DOJ. And so it was, um, it was that U.S. Attorney experience that I understood. In fact, I remember there's an office called the Executive Office of United States Attorney. And when you're a United States Attorney, a lot of your interactions are with EOUSA. And I remember how they sort of dominated our budgets, they dominated our kind of personnel actions, they dominated a lot of what we were doing. We'd have to call EOUSA and it was sort of, it was all kind of a one-stop shop for U.S. Attorney's offices, especially administration, but also um, other things. When I was a Chief of Staff and, and Attorney General, I would look down, I didn't even see EOUSA. Uh, all I saw was U.S. Attorney's offices and you know, kind of what they were doing and how they were doing it and my relationship with those um, you know, men and women that are serving in those important spots. And so, you know, I really think that being a U.S. attorney was, was the most important thing. You know, I had very little, just to answer your first part of your question, I had very little notice um, that anything was happening. Um, I had kind of, most of my notice had been what I had been reading in the paper for two months. I hate the sort of the anonymous sources and the leaks that are, that permeate Washington, D.C., especially in the New York Times and Washington Post. But you know, oftentimes when your name is mentioned, you sort of take note. And so there had been a series of articles um, 
about me and about my future um, uh, at the Department of Justice. But I fully expected uh, the moment that Jeff Sessions resigned the day after the midterm elections uh, that that there was there was a pretty good chance that I was I was done. I mean, usually a, a new attorney general would bring in a whole new chief staff, and there had been other people mentioned uh, who who would be acting uh, in addition to Rod Rosenstein. They talked about Alex Acosta, who was the labor secretary at the time. They talked about. Um, um, Alex Azar, who was the uh, HHS secretary. So there were other lawyers uh, that, that were also qualified to, you know, to, for the interim position. Um, and so that was, you know, I was very prepared one way or another. I, I, like I said, I, I really, to some extent, felt conscripted when I came to Washington, D.C. Um, to, to be chief of staff. And so I, to some extent, I, was, I wasn't, it wasn't like I, you know, was there permanently. I knew that I was there to get a job accomplished. So, and to some extent, you know, I I, I felt like, um, you know, I wanted, if possible, Jeff Sessions to be successful as Attorney General, and, and I worked every day as Chief of Staff to 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 make that happen. And then, as Acting Attorney General, you obviously, as you said, directly supervised the Mueller investigation. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an insight into what that was like on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, the, the Mueller investigation, when I finally took over, was was the investigation for the most part was over. Uh, the, the report had to be uh, written or was being written um, and they still had to charge Roger Stone. Um, and, but really, by and large, all of the, all the investigation was over. All, you know, everything, um, as we say in Iowa, the hay was in the barn. Um, and so there wasn't a lot sort of to do except, you know, what I would describe as land the plane and try to sort of, you know, get get it done and, and, and resolved and, I, and you know to some extent I believe now I even said at a press conference at one point in time that that the you know the Mueller investigation is is wrapping up and I really I I think you can look back and see that it was I mean it was just a matter of, of for whatever reason they waited to deliver the report and finalize the report once Bill Barr was there um, for a couple weeks after I left so um, you know the insight. You know the the only insight that that I can give you as to what it was like was uh, you know it was to some extent because that was at the time the tension in politics and you know the left the Democrats felt that that was their how they were going to um, do political damage or even you know sort of disqualify the president. Uh, and the right felt it was illegitimate from the start that the, you know the origins, which are still being looked at by John Durham, um, were were not based. You know there was no predicate for the investigation to start with, and so it was you know it was a you know it was it was just it was the main tension point of of, of D.C. politics, and so to be thrown into that um, really made me a target. And anybody, uh, and it's a, it's unfortunate because there's a lot of dedicated public servants that want what's best for their country that are in this administration. But anybody associated with Donald Trump oftentimes gets attacked uh, primarily by, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the media, like, you know, like I, like I mentioned, you know, places like CNN, MSNBC, um, Washington Post, New York Times, all those kind of outlets. And so to some extent, I mean, I just felt like I was, you know, punching bag for a while. You know, they were they were just they were sending reporters to my hometown to interview all these people. They were just there was a constant, um, just nobody knew who I was. I mean, that was you know, the bottom line. I came out of nowhere from their perspective because you know I had had been a U.S. attorney in Des Moines and then you know had spent eight years in private practice and then came to Washington D.C. as chief of staff. And chief of staffs usually are very uh, below the radar. Are not you know you sort of you can't. Most people can't name any chiefs of staff, maybe Mick at the White House, but you know every cabinet official has a chief of staff. And so that's, I mean, I just felt um, you know, I was kind of under fire is, is how it felt from the inside. But, but I also knew that I was doing the right thing. I knew that um, you know, I was gonna make the right decisions if I needed to, and at the same time, I was gonna make sure that no one could say that somehow I had illegitimately put my thumb on the investigation. Um, that, you know, again, I was going to follow law and the facts wherever they led. You just mentioned the media attention that you got. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you briefly worked as a CNN contributor. Yes, for four months. So having had first-hand experience on 
sort of both sides of the war between the Trump administration and the mainstream media. What insights, again, can you share with us on, on both sides of, yeah. of the issue, really? Well, I'll never forget. So before I even became a contributor, I, I, they had me on several times. And I think it was right as I was negotiating my contributorship contract with them, probably in the early summer of 17. And I, uh, I did a, a, probably it was probably a Don Lemon show, or maybe it was with Anderson Cooper, but it was one of those later you know, primetime evening shows. Said whatever I had to say, you know, I, I had it, the, 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 the panel was stacked against me, and, and in my ear, the producer said, you know, thank you, Matt, do you think we treated you fairly? And I, and I just, I, that struck me because I'd never, no, I'd never asked to be treated fairly. I didn't want to be treated, you know, I, was, I understand that sort of you jump in, you make your point. If you have a hot take or, you know, it's great. If you, if you say something that's uh, improper or, you know, the Twitter world will, you know, go after you and point out where you were wrong. So, I mean, I, I thought that was an interesting introduction to, because I had, again, I had not spent a lot of time in, DC politics. I mean, I, I certainly understood it. I'd spent, you know, I'd obviously been there um, for my job and for other things that I was doing, other projects I was working on. But it wasn't. I wasn't a creature of the swamp, as they would call it. Um, you know, th there is. I think there is a lot of unfair attacks on this president, and you know, it's just it's it's hard. You know, I, I'd love to catalog them, um, but at the same time, you know, he's unafraid to defend himself and you know he want, obviously wants others to jump in the fray and defend him but you know he's 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 really good at, at at that kind of pushing back against you know some of those the false narratives but you know that's really um, the thing that I learned in Washington DC to some extent is this 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 these overarching narratives that that take hold and then people looking for facts that support those narratives and are consistent with those narratives, and so there's these kind of these big arching themes, and then everyone's marshalling, you know, sm smaller facts to support those those are overarching narratives. But some of them don't have enough gravity to, you know, they're here one day and gone the next, um, you know. And I just again, it, it just so many things flashed through my mind. There was this, you know, if you think about, there was a moment in time where there was this CEO of I think Overstock.com. That had some big bombshell about somebody in the you know in the, in the Russian interference, and they put him on TV, and then like a day later he was gone, and then nobody talked about it. Again. And these, so these things come up, and then they just sort of disappear. And it's I just it's 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 fascinating to me, um, you know how every single reporter in Washington D.C. and there are there are hundreds if not thousands of reporters in Washington D.C. are looking for a unique angle, and they're just always checking their sources and trying to find out. If something's true, so they can report it, and they're you know they're they're told they need to be on Twitter and they need to get so many tweets out and they need to write so many stories and it's just it really just causes a lot of things um, that are that are irrelevant to most Americans' lives um, to be reported. It, it, it's I find it the most frustrating thing of being you know spending time in Washington D.C. is just how most of what is talked about and worried about inside the, the beltway, inside of Washington, D.C., inside of the American government, and all three branches, just has <laughs> no significance to ordinary Americans' lives. It's become kind of a sport we watch for entertainment. And on the, the subject of President Trump, something I noticed during your remarks is that you said when Donald Trump gets reelected instead of if. Yeah. What makes you so sure that he will get reelected? Oh, I mean, I, I'm optimistic. So I was, um, you know, I'm an Iowan. I was at the Iowa caucuses. Um, I was able to talk to a lot of my friends and, and people that I know and, and people that I'd never met, um, both at the rally and then, you know, sort of during the time that we went back um, as, as uh, to speak in favor of him. And, and I just see a lot of enthusiasm. You know, there, there is, um, they set a record. Uh, so the Iowa caucuses typically if the if the party in power has has a caucus, usually it's just the party hardcores that show up, mm -hmm. and 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 this caucus they broke a record. It's the most people that have ever caucused for an incumbent president. And then we saw in New Hampshire uh, a week later where it was the most people that ever voted in a primary in New Hampshire for the incumbent president. And I just I see a lot of enthusiasm, and you know, and and I also look at the polls, and it's it's interesting um, when you look at polls that say. 
Um, you know, kind of, do you like Trump or not like Trump? But then, do you like his policies or don't like his po uh, like his policies? And there's a, he has a real strong majority in people that like his policies that are seeing it take effect in their own lives. Um, and so I just, I, you know, I just think there's a lot of optimism. And I, and I watch the, you know, I'm watching the Democrats. I, I'm, I'm interested in politics, always have been. I watched their debate the other night, and I just, I don't see any of those people right now being able to stand toe to toe with the president and and offer a more compelling future than than what the president can offer. I mean, it's it is um, it's a really interesting time in American history. I, I wonder, you know, I, I think to some extent, you know, it is said that that Obama was a response to George Bush and and Trump was a response to Obama, and so it'll be interesting, kind of long playing the long game, um, you know, after 2020. 2024, sort of where we go as a country. And where do you think the U.S. will go in 2024? I don't know. I, I think that, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's about 15 political lifetimes uh, <laughs> between now and then. But, I mean, I think, you know, we, we are a center-right country. And, you know, Democrats uh, win elections when they are uh, in favor of entrepreneurs, in favor of uh, a strong economy and not big government. I think, I think we have um, rejected oftentimes big government liberalism where government is the solution to sort of everything that ails society. I think we have oftentimes either pushed it down to the states, which were kind of the laboratories of innovation and, and, and should be in sort of the, you know, kind of regulating people's lives. Um, one of the things you see in the United States because of the way our, the state and federal government's relationship and the way our constitutional structure is, is you oftentimes see people that can't accomplish uh, a policy at the state level, uh, then come to the federal government and try to get it passed as a one size fits all kind of top down. And, and I just, uh, that's something that I guess, you know, as a, as a basic political philosophy, I reject. I would much rather try some things out, uh, some ideas, whether it's welfare reform, whether it's uh, you know, whatever the federal government uh, doesn't uniquely have jurisdiction of and have that, have those experiments done at the state level and see how they're implemented. Um, I, I think of, I think of, uh, you know, health insurance and health care as, as a place where we could, you know, have, try different things in states and see what that, you know, what the best system for that would be. And in 2014, you ran an Iowa senatorial campaign and as you mentioned, you're an Iowan yourself. What do you think went wrong in Iowa for the Democrats this year? And do you think it should still start the caucuses? Yeah. So in 1976, uh, Jimmy Carter was won the Iowa caucuses, and it kind of propelled him to the nomination. And that made the Iowa caucuses relevant. And the caucuses were really uh, party or our party functions. They're not, they're not state functions. They're not run by the Secretary of State. They're, they're party functions. The Republicans run a caucus. Democrats run a caucus. And... Um, it's kind of a, a preference poll, a straw poll, and it's always, um, and in fact, when Jimmy Carter won in 76, the Iowa caucuses, he was beat. He was beat by undecided, <laughs> but he got second place to undecided, and that sort of propelled him uh, to, to victory. And so the caucuses have always been a party function, a preference, and kind of a straw poll. And I think this last time, the Democrats tried to be too cute and put too much on it. And what they did, and I don't know if it was to try to help or prevent a candidate's success, but they, the Democrats, unlike the Republicans, uh, take, uh, take it a step further on the preference. And they have this idea of viability, where if you don't get 15% of, of your room, if this was a caucus, we all, we're all neighbors, it's our precinct caucus, we would uh, we divide up in the room, you know, Biden's over there, Bernie over there, and you divide all the candidates in the corners, and then you'd count and divide, it's a little bit of math, but you'd divide the number, full, total number of the people in the room by how many people are coxing. If you're below 15%, you're deemed not viable in that precinct, and you have to either leave or join another candidate. And that's, that's used to be the fun part of the Democrat caucus was the viability, because then all the other caucus corners of the viable candidates would, would yell and conjole and try to convince others of the non-viable candidates to join them. Um, this time they took a, just like a, a, an initial, how many people in the room are for each candidate. So if you were below 15%, you still 
your vote was counted, and they reported they were supposed to report those numbers, and then they took the post viability number, and then there was some there was a third way. Oh, then there's this this bizarre uh, del state convention delegate equivalent, which was a convoluted how many people voted for Democrats four years ago in the presidential race, and so so more Democrat the more Democratic the precinct, the more state delegate equivalent, and this is why I didn't study math, by the way, because I'm not so good with the math, and neither are Democrats. But um, <laughs> that being said, so they were trying to report all these three numbers, and, instead, and then instead of, of just doing it like they've always done it, which is you call in, uh, or even you know cell phone, take a picture of the, what, what the, the thing said, there were only 23, 2200 sites, caucus locations. Um, they decided they were gonna use an app, and the app, Nobody tested or nobody thought to, you know, it's like everything else in technology. Once you get to a certain tipping point, then the stuff doesn't work. And so the app, um, can I say this, took a took, uh, pause. <laughs> it went to the loo and, um, and, there, and, then, and then they had a hard time because they just, they just weren't, hadn't thought about how to ultimately report the results. Now, I will point out that was the Iowa Democrats. Iowa Republicans had no problem reporting the results that night, and you know the numbers were you know verified and uh, uh, the same night. Now you know we've the Iowa caucuses are party functions, and the, and the real purpose is to identify people to participate in the party apparatus, um, to serve as county chairs, to serve as delegates to you know to work on the platform committee all the kind of stuff that parties do um and and they're not meant to be a primary and that's the real challenge is 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 um, new hampshire has said that we have the first primary in the country by state law new hampshire is always going to go first if it's a primary and so we can't in iowa make it look like a primary that's why you can't vote early it's why you can't do all the kind of things that you would typically do if it was a primary mm -hmm. and so that's why the iowa caucuses are always so um, difficult to understand. One of the, the, the best benefit of the, of the Iowa caucus is it forces candidates to do retail politics. Iowans are very sophisticated, both Republicans and Democrats, are very sophisticated when it comes to candidates and judging political horse flesh. And they want to ask their questions. They want to know where you stand on their issues. And they're not going to let kind of people just run blanket ads and cover the state with television ads. And that's what ultimately the choice is going to be. If, 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 if there's this movement to get rid of the Iowa caucuses, get rid of New Hampshire and all these, these four early states that have preferred status, you have Iowa, then New Hampshire, and, you know, and then the Republicans and Democrats switch to South Carolina and Nevada. Democrats are doing Nevada first, and then South Carolina Republicans typically do South Carolina first and then Nevada. Nonetheless, those four states have all are allowed to go earlier than other states, which is what Super Tuesday is on, on March 3rd, I believe, where all this, the first day that other states can have their primaries. And so that's a long way of saying that Iowans, um, the only way you're ever going to vet candidates at a retail political level is with things like the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary. Otherwise, uh, you're just going to end up with big states and uh, people with the most money running ads. And, and you know, like what you saw with Bloomberg, I mean, it was... Mm -hmm. It was fascinating to watch how you know he rose in the polls up until he did his first debate, and then and then you know it was so bad that you know I think he's going to have to spend another three or four hundred million dollars to to overcome that. And you know I mean fundamentally you know politics is is about people and personalities, and you can only get so far if you're not authentic, if you're not a real person, if you don't you know kind of stand for a real kind of rock-solid vision for the future of our country. I mean, I think the American people are oftentimes skeptical. So that's a long way to answer Thank your question. Thank you. No, that was very interesting. <laughs> um, we will move to audience questions now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and then stand up while asking your question. And could we start with the member in the back row? You talked a bit there about authenticity in politics, and I guess if there's one point that ran through both the impeachment and also the Mueller report, it was foreign intervention in US politics. Now, if you take the example of the Mueller report, there was no criminal conspiracy found, as you said, but what they did find was more than 100 contacts between Trump campaign members and Russian contacts. 
when it comes to the impeachment scenario. Can we imagine how Republicans might have reacted if President Obama had asked Israel, Saudi Arabia to investigate Donald Trump hotel deals in Central Asia or, or the Middle East and leverage the relationship based on that? Yeah. Do you worry at all that there is a risk of normalising or creating a precedent in foreign activities in US elections and US politics? I want to be clear. I'm, I, have, I am never going to deny that Russia tried to interfere in 2016. They tried to interfere in 2018, and they're trying to interfere in 2020. In fact, their interference in American elections, and not just American elections, but a lot of other free countries' elections, goes back to probably Reagan, I'm guessing. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we have to be on guard. And, and at the Department of Justice, especially at the FBI, we had a unique um, view as to how to interrupt their efforts. It, it's, it's, it's a counter-espionage, counter-intelligence, I mean, all the kind of things that, that you do um, uh, when, when other countries are trying to interfere in your domestic um, elections and your domestic policy. Um, I, 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 I never want to play um, hypotheticals because I, I mean, there's always another hypothetical, right? And so you're, this idea that what happened, what would, what would be the case? Uh, what I know is the the beauty of the U.S. Constitution is the House, which is elected every two years, every member is elected every two years, can be a lot more um, emotional than the Senate. And the impeachment process is set up very much to work just like it did, which was the, you know, the, the House reacted emotionally to something that, um, that they saw as a uh, overstep by the president in, in asking for, uh, a, for the Ukrainian president to do us a favor, I think was the exact quote. And at the same time, the Senate shut it down because the two-thirds, I mean, two-thirds is overwhelming and bipartisan. And so I actually don't think there's any normalization of anything. I think it's just there's a, th there's a fundamental threshold that you have to get to that two-thirds, and you saw it in Watergate. I mean, everybody believed that what Richard Nixon did um, crossed the line, crimes were committed, and there was no doubt not only was he going to be impeached, but he was going to be convicted and thrown out of office. And, and I think that's where fundamentally the Republicans in the Senate came down, and I think 52 of the 53 on the first article and all 53 on the second article, they came down on this idea that this was not an impeachable offense. I mean, they, you, I can imagine all, all sorts of scenarios that are impeachable offenses, um, and I, my biggest fear, though, is when it's, when it's not bipartisan, when, it's, when there aren't Republicans and Democrats in the House and in the Senate um, meeting both the thresholds, that this ends up cheapening actually a very powerful tool. And I think we're going to see, you know, I, I fear, I mean, we, we, see, we saw it with Clinton where although the, you know, the impeachment articles were bipartisan, I think, you know, ultimately, um, you, know, the, the, you know, they didn't reach the two-thirds. And in this case, it was a purely partisan line, except for Mitt Romney, uh, and then a couple of Democrats in the House that didn't vote for the articles. But I, I see this as uh, whoever, you know, as soon as there's an opposition party in the House, we're going to have another impeachment because, again, abuse of power, just there's no elements. And so, any, you know, anybody can be charged with abuse of power, and it's just what does a majority in the House think abuse of power is? Um, and it's... It, it's not going to be good for our republic, uh, but at the same time, as uh, I think a lot of Americans love gridlock, they like the status quo, and they don't want Congress to screw up our you know, laws or our, our country any more than they already have, and so they prefer they are chasing rabbits down rabbit holes uh, like this instead of actually, you know. But, but I believe that there are so many problems that I would prefer they actually start working on some of these problems on a bipartisan basis. And that's, that's where, you know, if you talk about a more perfect union and, and working towards that goal that our founders in the United States believed in, I think we have to start finding the states women and the states men that are willing to roll up their sleeves and work together to solve some of these just huge, massive problems. And again, I mean, the reason they don't ever do that is because they're hard.
and you know, oftentimes there aren't easy, any easy solutions. Hi, uh, my name is Rahul. Uh, I have two short questions. Uh, the first is, so your successor, uh, William Barr, recently noted that Trump constantly tweeting his views uh, is a bit of a problem for him, and like that makes his job harder. Um, do you share that assessment? And then secondly, uh, there was a controversy where Trump attacked a judge who had uh, uh, sort of issued an adverse ruling against him, and Chief Justice Roberts came out to say that we have no Trump judges, Obama judges, Clinton judges, and so on. We only have uh, judges who are co committed to the Constitution. So where do you come down on that controversy? I believe Bill Barr, when he says that the president tweeting about open cases is not helpful for him uh, running the Department of Justice and administering justice. Uh, I mean, I don't have any reason to um, doubt that you know, Bill Barr is a very serious, smart individual. Um, I, I was lucky that I didn't have um, the president tweeting about cases, uh, except for the Mueller investigation, while I was acting attorney general. So that you know, that was that was a, that was a, that was good f for my experience. And so I, I, I believe you know, and and the president even acknowledged the other day. I saw as he was just heading out to out west. That he even said, I, I understand, you know, that what Bill says, and I, I, it probably does make it harder for him to do his job. Um, on the second question, I, I, Judge Roberts, it, you know, has to run the courts, and 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 I understand his position. However, every single one of those judges is pre is presidentially appointed, and so. To, to some extent, there are Clinton appointee judges, there are Trump appointee judges, there are. Bush judges, I like for example, I mean, you know, a lot of my friends um, are currently on the courts, and they were appointed by Bush, and they were appointed by Trump. Um, you will see in the American system of jurisprudence, and and, and again, most cases, non-controversial cases, um, fall out exactly the way they should. Um, but you know, you I can tell you. When you're in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, if you have two Obama judges and one Trump judge, and it's a it's a it's an issue that that is that falls on some question that is maybe political or or maybe um, you know sort of where there's a conservative version and a and a liberal version, you are probably going to lose that case two to one um, because the liberal judges will see the, the case one way and the conservative judge will see it the other way. And that's just, that's just the way it works. And the Supreme Court currently is 5-4 on, on uh, conservatives versus liberals. And, and a lot of the issues they're deciding come out ultimately on the side of conservatives. Five, you know, there's been a lot of 5-4 decisions. And so, I mean, I understand what Roberts is saying, uh, that judges you know, are supposed to just call balls and strikes and say what the law is, not what the law should be. But that's just not most Americans' experience in the courts, in the federal courts. It's just, and so um, I understand his rebuke, but at the same time, you know, there is, there are cases that come out on, you know, based on who appointed the judge, and that's just the way it is. Um, you already touched on this a little bit when talking to Sarah, but I wanted to ask what you think the future of the Republican Party specifically is, given that many people argue that Trump has shaped it to be his own party rather than sort of a general Republican Party. How do you think there's, there's going to be a way to find a successor to him? That's an amazing question. Um, and, it, and, and before, you know, when I, when I didn't know I was coming to Washington, D.C., and Trump was the president and I was you know, kind of working on CNN, one of the, I had thought about the idea of writing a book called, you know, Conservatism in the Age of Trump, and, com and com kind of, because it has been some of these issues, whether it's, whether it's trade, um, comes to mind especially, but there are some other issues that, that are, that the traditional Republican orthodoxy are not consistent with where, what Trump's uh, view is. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, he has, as you point out, I think dramatically shaped the Republican Party uh, on some of these issues as well, and taken it to you know to the place where where he is. You know, China is another example of where you know he has in both trade and just our relationship with trading relationship with China, but also our stance towards China. 
a, an area, a place where I've been several times, worked with, worked on, and see sort of you know the unique challenges we face um, with China. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I'm going to have to see how once Trump, you know, in 2024 is not on the ballot, what um, what the coalition looks like because right now it's very interesting. You know, the president brought. Um, uh, non-college educated white working class Americans in droves to his message and but it's but it's bigger than that it's bigger than that I mean that was a, that was a large block that he attracted with his message um, but at the same time you know he brought he's brought so many other um, I think you know one of the reasons I'm so optimistic about the 2020 prospects is is the president has done so much work by and for and with the African American community. Uh, I look at what we did, you know, when I was acting Attorney General, we passed, Congress passed, and we were implementing the First Step Act, uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, I've been working on some, some pardons recently um, in that regard as well. And, and I just, I think, you know, he's gonna, he's the, the African American community in the United States um, does, not, does not believe that Donald Trump was hostile towards him. In fact, he knows that uh, they know that he's working uh, for their benefit, whether it's in the criminal justice area, whether it's in the economy, you know, uh, African-Americans, unemployment rates the lowest has been um, really, you know, in my lifetime. And so it's, it's really an extraordinary record that, that he's going to be able to run on. And in some of those states, if he gets four or five, six percent more uh, votes from, from those communities, it's, there's, the Democrats can't compete. And it's, so I, that's where I, I, a lot of my optimism comes from. Could we go to the member in the back? Um, a company who advised world patent marketing was fined $25 million by the FTC for scamming thousands of Americans, during which time you were quoted threatening victims with criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. Is this appropriate behavior for someone who went on to serve as the Attorney General? That's not an accurate, uh, that, that's, the, that's the media report uh, of, funny, yes. yeah, I know, but that, the, 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 the story, the story actually, you know, I, they were, I was on a board of advisors for, for them and um, paid ultimately, I think in a couple of years, about $10,000. And there were several of us, um, you know, professors at universities. There was a, per, a gentleman that went on to be a member of Congress that were all on this advisory board. The advisory board never met. None of us had any idea what, was, what the company was doing. Ultimately, once the FTC came in, you know, sort of this, the advisory board was really kind of had been dismantled. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I feel bad. I think, you know, I, I had no idea that it was a fraud or like the FTC found. And so, I mean, I feel bad for the customers of that company that, that, uh, that were, you know, felt that they were taken advantage of. And, but, you know, ultimately the, the news reports, and I haven't had a chance to really talk about it, but, you know, the news reports were inaccurate, but it was just, to some extent, not worth pushing back and trying to explain because you know I know in my heart that you know sort of what you know my role was so insignificant, and you know I had I was out you know an outside advisor really had nothing to do with their operations. But thanks for that question. I mean, I, it's. Could we go to the member in the second row? Um, I have a question. You've been quoted to say that judges should have a biblical view on. Uh, <laughs> On decisions. I just Biblical worldview was the exact quote, yes. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you feel you've been quoted correctly and if you do think that there is some implication of religion or moral that you think maybe there cannot be such a thing as justice without a religious view. I mean, the, 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 I, the, I was running for Senate in 2014 and we were at a, uh, a candidate forum and we were talking about judges and, you know, I, 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 I did say that. What, you know, but I was thinking more from a um, a New Testament Christian worldview of, you know, of mercy and justice and forgiveness and all the kind of things and the values that, that you know, that I've learned uh, throughout my, you know, life in uh, being a, you know, Christian. So, I, you know, I hadn't really, I didn't mean that as a sort of disqualifying other, um, other religions from serving as judges. Um, and I know that that's what the ultimately a very, you know, liberal columnist took that to me. And I, you know, I don't, I, she took great liberties uh, putting words in my mouth, but you know, I mean, fundamentally, um, 
you know, we see it, the greatness of America is its diversity and its people. And so, you know, I, I look much more if, you know, as to judges, uh, as to what, you know, what their qualifications are, what their experience is. Um, but worldview also is going to come into that. Um, you know, the good news um, is I don't have to, I'm not picking judges. Uh, you know, I'm not the president of the United States. And so uh, as a U.S. senator, I just kind of was, uh, I mean, as a potential U.S. senator, I was just uh, talking about kind of how I would look at a president's, and you remember it was Obama at the time, and just sort of how I would look at his potential nominees. So ultimately, the people of Iowa didn't um, share uh, my uh, belief that I would be the best U.S. Senator. They ended up, uh, Joni Ernst became the nominee, beat me in a primary, and then uh, Joni's a current U.S. Senator, so, it was, and she's a great friend, and I'm proud of her, and I know she's uh, doing the job really well, and she's got a re-election here in 2020 in Iowa, and I'm doing everything I can to help to get her re-elected. We have time for one final question. Could we go to the member in the back row? In an interview with Fox News host Laura Ingraham, you said that abuse of power is not a crime. Um, as a non-lawyer, I'm a bit confused, let's say it up, uh, let's um, call it this way, and I would be interested in a discussion. So is the president now allowed to ask for personal favors? I would like to quote, for example, um, Lama Alexander, a Republican senator, who on the 31st of 2020 said that there is no more, need to, um, no more need for evidence to prove that the president asked Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden because the president admitted it himself. He later voted to um, acquit Trump for other reasons. So um, basically, he already said, okay, we know that the president did this, so is the president allowed for more, ask for personal favors? And is the president allowed to basically uh, call for reduced sentences for his associates, for example, Roger, Mo uh, Roger Stone, or for Michael Flynn, with Comey, or with Barr, or via Twitter? And is the president also allowed to demote um, people like um, Vintman's brother, Yevgeny, who basically had nothing to do at all with the entire um, Ukraine impeachment scandal? Mm -hmm. Is this not abuse of power? Can you please explain this to me as a non-lawyer? Sure. So there's a lot of parts to that. Uh, I'm going to break it down pretty simply. I, I think I, I mean, I mentioned um, kind of my view of this abuse of power theory, and that is um, abuse of power does not have any elements. There's no tradition in um, the common law that we share uh, and, and actually inherited from the United Kingdom um, of, of, a, of a crime of abuse of power. And so then it ends up being, you know, sort of my experiences as a prosecutor and bringing charges where you have elements and then you have facts and you line those two things up. And um, that's, that, you know, that... I was really just using a shorthand uh, and because of TV and the, the, the clock is ticking and winding down. Didn't have a ton of time to explain my theory, so I appreciate you know, a little more opportunity to expand on that. Um, you know, Lamar Alexander did vote to acquit on both, on both charges. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges is we see, we got the, we got the transcript and we, we read the transcript and, and everybody can see you know, what the transcript says. Um, in, uh, in what the president did. I, I, you know, again, I don't, I, I, I agree with the Republicans. It's not, it's not a impeachable offense. I don't think it provides a safe harbor that now the president can, you know, ask for personal favors, uh, as you would suggest. Um, I, I just, you know, I don't, I don't read that, uh, the outcome as that. Um, you know, the more interesting question that you raise, which is, is kind of the personnel question as to, you know, sort of, I have always felt that the president sets foreign policy. The Constitution is very clear on the president has broad latitude in foreign policy. Um, and, you know, I have always, I, I've always felt that if you, you know, these, the, the people that are, that are in the executive branch, whether it's at the NSC, whether it's at the Department of Justice, whether it's at the State Department, that they, um, need to implement the president's foreign policy agenda. And that's, you know, we, we can, some of us can disagree with whether we share that foreign policy um, uh, view, but, you know, ultimately the president won the election. And if you disagree with it, then run against him and, you know, and become president and put your own uh, foreign policy in place. I mean, there are plenty of examples where Republicans disagreed with Obama's foreign policy 
uh, objectives and you know didn't impeach him um, this is uh, again I don't think this provides there's really nothing to read from this other than a majority of Republicans in the Senate and all of the Republicans in the House did not believe that this was an impeachable offense and most of the Democrats in the House and all of the Democrats in the Senate believed it was and that's you know that is where I draw the line is I just think and it has to be a greater showing. And, and again, elections fundamentally have consequences. And this is, this is where we find ourselves um, as a country. So I hope that addressed some of your, it didn't address it at all, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but please join me in thanking Matthew for joining thank us. Thank you.